I think we're going to be introduced. So everybody hold tight just for another minute. <laughs> We've got one more panelist coming. Uh, and I think Elaine is introducing us. Uh, and then we'll get going here. <clears throat> How lovely. Hi, Mushai. Hi. All right. I don't see Elaine. So I'll off. Uh, my name is Deborah, and I, I love supply chain. In fact, it gets me out of bed nice and early in the morning. I'm currently in the West Coast of the United States. It is 3.30 in the morning here. Uh, but I cannot be more excited about the panelists that we have today. Uh, we are going to explore circularity, and um, it's our path to a sustainable future. And the circular economy, of course, is the concept that Materials have a lot of value to give to our, our economy. We're not fully utilizing all of that uh, value today. And done properly, we can create jobs, elongate our supply chains, uh, as in the longevity of those supply chains and, of course, the success of our operations. So together today, we're going to explore this concept. Uh, we're going to cover two major topics. We're first going to talk about um, the need to stop planning, stop making business cases, and really start moving into taking action. What can we do to get started today uh, to take our operations more circular? The second topic we'll cover is around what we're calling the first mover disadvantage. And we'll explore this topic a little bit uh, that just getting started sometimes can come with some risks to our companies. So we're gonna kick off this panel uh, with the panelists, please introducing all of yourselves and in one sentence, share what circularity means for you. Uh, Sherry, can you kick us off please? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Sherry Heinish, and I also love supply chain like Deborah. I also love sustainability and circular economy and diversity and inclusion. So I'm super excited to be here today and hopefully tie some of these concepts together. Circularity to me means that we walk on a restorative path that maximizes the potential in all things, life, people, materials, nature and technology. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Inigo, can you please introduce yourself and give one sentence on what circularity means to you? Certainly. Good morning, everyone. My name is Inigo Canalejo. I am Sustainability Director for CHEPS in the, in the region, CHEP and Brambles. Uh, basically, we are the largest reusable packaging company in the world. We help move more products to more people than any other company in the world. And we do this in a sustainable way. Our, our customers share and reuse our platforms, our products across the supply chain. And this reduces, obviously, the need for new raw materials, natural resources, and, and the generation of, of waste. So we're actually a living example of a, of a circular economy business model operating at a, at a global scale. And if I had to choose one sentence, that's a tough one, but probably I would say doing more with less. That is all around the circular economy, right? How can we decouple the relationship between economic and social growth from the use of natural resources? Perfect. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Mushai, please. All right. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mushai Konyeha. I'm the chairman of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers based in Nairobi, Kenya. And I also operate a business which is in agricultural inputs called CKL Africa Limited. Um, we do a lot of work uh, around sustainability with our membership. We've got members across 14 sectors, and I've been championing that in the um, association for a while now. Circularity, in a sentence for me, is how do we optimize the use of resources in a resource-challenged world, and more specifically for us in a resource-challenged continent. Thanks, Deborah. Lovely. Welcome. Uh, and Anton, please. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Anton Pitsia. I work for a company called uh, Relog uh, in South Africa, and we are a um, supply chain uh, consulting firm and infrastructure design. And uh, in our designs, um, we always have um, sustainability and green designs at top of mind and always trying to get the best and most out of uh, optimized uh, operations, specifically um, distribution infrastructure. And to me, um, circular um, supply chain is is blowing life into into used toys um, and getting the most out of everything that uh, that we can do. And it's it's it needs to become a lifestyle, and I think uh, something we need to follow. And the linear economy should be something we actually frown upon going forward. Lovely, thank you. Welcome. 
All right, let's get started. So our first topic, like I mentioned, is this idea that we can start taking action today. Uh, Sherry, you host a podcast called The Supply Chain Revolution, and you've mentioned that recently uh, a guest has shared with you a sentiment that it's really time to let's stop worrying about this business case. It's there, it's been made, and move into taking action. Uh, can you share parts of that discussion and your thoughts on it, please? Sure. So I actually have a couple guests that shared a point of view tied to your question, Deborah. Uh, Dr. Gary Cooper from Reapley, he's the CEO of Reapley, and then also John Holm, who is at Pixera Global. And I want to frame these insights in an overarching concept called incrementalism. And that's what we discussed in preparing for this session. So this is the belief in or advocacy of change by degrees. Um, gradual small changes. And this is by and large the transition from a linear economy to a sustainable economy. So the problem with incrementalism is that we end up iterating in a bad system. And as John Holmes says, you know, there are really no good choices in a bad system, only choosing between less bad. So I want everyone to ask yourself, why do we keep pushing a sustainable business agenda when what we really need is a circular economy, an economy where everyone can participate, including folks that are left behind in a linear world? And I think, you know, one thing that's been teased out of all the episodes this year is that we have a chance to leapfrog in certain parts of the world where incrementalism is ripe for disruption disruption. And, and I believe that Africa can lead the way. So, so back to your, your question, why do we keep pushing the business case? So this is from Dr. Gary Cooper. The business case is the biggest marketplace that I know, and that's earth. Climate change is the number one risk facing businesses and our survival, according to WEF. Are we going to wait until we literally can't walk outside and breathe. What's the ROI on breathable air? Have we gotten so far away from the concept of doing good that now it has to be justified? Black Lives Matter, exploiting communities that are already marginalized people. That's wrong. Why, why do we need a business case for doing the right thing? And I think when it comes to circularity, you know, that's what we're going to unpack today. We're going to unpack the right thing. And the last the last point that I want to highlight is that in order to make the circular economy real, it has to operate with the leave no one behind mantra. And this means tri-sector partnerships and collaboration. So that collaboration at the local community level is critical. And this is less about someone else coming in and prescribing transition, but communities, African communities owning this and leading this change. Thank you. Lovely, and uh, I'll ask for more responses for that in just a moment. Uh, Mushai, you have spoken about uh, the multi-stakeholder environment um, within these communities uh, that's required for the transition to a circular economy. Can you share um, your ideas for collaboration across these complex stakeholder environments, please? Yeah, thanks, Deborah. I think, um, Obviously, circularity is a response to uh, the environmental and climate change challenge that we all face um, in the world. And I think the starting point is for us to all admit that we, you know, we are part of the problem, as well as hopefully part of the solution. And we are part of the problem because, you know, we are consumers and we are beneficiaries. So uh, if we take like plastics, which we did a lot of work on in Kenya, we are all taking in the plastic. We, we we buy the food, we buy the shampoo, we buy, and we want all of those things because so I'm not quite a believer that we necessarily want to go back to living, you know, basic lives where we just bathed by the river and um, covered ourselves in leaves, you know, or whatever else. People, people, we've gotten used to all this sophistication and we, we enjoy it, but then we know it's not sustainable. So it's, how can we marry this? So, and not only are we beneficiaries, but we are also influencers because um, all the pressure we're getting, all the um, 
what the public thinks about the environment, the climate change activism, the people who are participating, it's, it's us again. So the solutions lie with us and we need everybody together. And it is in everybody's interest to, to have this conversation. But the challenge always has been is how do we get all these people together at one table and have a conversation? Because on one hand, and I come from a manufacturing background, we have um, demonstrations on uh, the environment. So it's, it's, it's a demonstration out there and we are sitting in our boardroom trying to go through our business plan and whatnot. How are we going to be able to have this uh, conversation? Governments, on the other hand, are worried about the environment. They're, you know, they're having all these conversations, COP21 and so on, and responding to that pressure and doing their own thing, whether it's regulating. In Africa, we've had the, I'd say the misfortune, our governments tend to be a little bit more um, authoritarian. So they've just, they just throw out regulations and rules and say, now you're going to follow these rules, uh, whether they are practical or real or not. So that becomes, again, a challenge. And then, of course, there are manufacturers, and I think there's a lot of supply chain people over here who are thinking about, we've got to make a profit. We are a business. What's this going to cost us? How are we going to get around this? Because, you know, it's their end year target, quarter target. How are we going to get around this? And I think that's the one of the great inventions, or I think one of the benefits of circularity is that it gives us a space and a language where all these parties can come together and have a conversation. Because it's, it's, the conversation is things that we can all agree on. So it's a nice space where we can all come in, have a good conversation. The environmentalists, we say about we want to conserve resources. We want to make sure the resources are, we know they are not infinite. We need to conserve them and reuse them and, and so on, keep them going. And that's a conversation they can engage in so they can come in. When we talk about from business, we talk about you can save money, you can save uh, cost, um, you can innovate. There's opportunity to innovate and do new things. Um, and you can create jobs. And immediately we say jobs, you know, the, the government is here and uh, mm -hmm. all regulators are in and they're like, yes, let's create jobs. Let's innovate. That's conversation. So circularity is a great uh, table around which we can have a conversation and make a change for the environment, like we say, because we need to make those changes. But first, we need to be all at the same table and have that conversation because it's going to affect all of us in how we consume, our behavior needs to change, in how we actually regulate and how we source our products and how we manufacture. So thanks. Yeah, that's my bit on multi-stakeholders. I love that, uh, especially as we're coming up to American Thanksgiving this week. We're thinking a lot about tables and who's a responsible attendee at our tables in our country right now. Um, but I love that idea of having circularity as a table that brings us all together. And uh, I will start framing it like that. And I will give you credit. Uh, Inigo, as we think about all coming to the table together, one of the um, challenges that you have explored before is in order to have these meaningful conversations and move forward together, we need to have lo some level of standardization. If I say, A, do you understand it's that it's the same A, for example. Um, and this is somehow preventing us as a community from taking steps forward today. Uh, can you expand a little bit on that, share some examples and potentially a recommendation or two on how we move forward? Certainly, yeah, I think standardization is a, is a key enabler of the circular economy, especially if you want to do it at a large scale, right? So for, in order for people to come together into that table, you need to set the right standards for it to work, right? Uh, so we need to basically integrate the circular economy into the design principles of products, services, and supply chain, right? Um, and this doesn't really happen that way today. Products are not made to be refurbished, dismantled. Products are, are not made to last, actually. They're quite the opposite. Uh, a lot of the products are actually made to, to, to break down. No? So the more standards that you have in an industry, obviously the easier this transition to the circular economy. And I'll give you a, a, a good example on that. The, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation estimated that if, you know, if uh, mobile phones were made uh, using standard processes, that they were would be made uh, in a way that they can be uh, dismantled in a standard way. If the, let's say, key components were standard components like screens, uh, cameras, batteries, etc., the cost of, of refurbishing a mobile phone would be reduced by 50%. So again, imagine the facilitation that that creates in order for products actually, you know, to have an extended, you know, one, two, 
three more lives in the market. Um, and what our, our company does, what, what Chep does is, is probably a, a great example on, on the importance that standardization plays in making this at a, again, at a large scale. So, um, our, our customers share and reuse our platforms in the supply chain in wide, let's say, ranges of different supply chains. And it's end to end as well from the beginning of the supply chain until the end of the supply chain. So our products are standard with regards to, um, the size and the materials, but everything else around the supply chain needs to be standard as well, as well for companies to be able to reuse these products in the supply chain. So anything going from uh, a forklift truck, uh, obviously to the warehouse, to the truck size that where the pallets go into, even to automated warehouses that are being developed now, they need to be done in a in a in a standard way for the system to work. If everybody had their own standard of building warehouses, of building trailers, forklift trucks, there would be no opportunity for these products to be reused in the in the economy. Let's say in the in the supply chain. So our products can be used uh, today by Unilever. Tomorrow they would be reused by Pick and Pay, and the day after they can be reused by RCL Foods, right? And it's all because the whole supply chain shares uh, the same standard. So I think obviously that is a, a, a critical component. And if a product is not standard, it's, it is very difficult, a product or beyond the product, not the infrastructure it is very difficult for the circular economy to thrive, especially at this large scale. Starting to get after my heart here on how we think about circular supply chains and what does it even mean? And I'm not sure as a community we're even clear on, would we all describe a circular supply chain the same way? And then I'm reminded, frankly, we don't all describe supply chains the same way. So I think there's a, a <laughs> lot of rich conversation here. Uh, and we'll come back to this. Uh, Anton, uh, let's hear from you. You've shared that behavior changes are needed across the value chain um, and those should be done because it's the right thing to do. So we're gonna loop back, Sherry, to what you have uh, kicked us off with today. Um, it's, it's not always about the money. Sometimes it's about the right thing uh, to do. Can you share a couple of these behavior changes that we need to see, um, certainly from the consumer side, but also as we think about designing and maintaining operating our supply chains? Sure, thanks, um, Deborah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, to change people's behaviors, um, it can be a very slow process, and it talks to Sherry's um, incrementalism. Um, so it requires a lot of change management um, and convincing that people are doing uh, the right thing. Um, and sometimes it's difficult since the strategy, the strategy is long-term, and people are looking for instant uh, gratification. Um, so you really need to sketch a very vivid um and clear picture to all parties involved to actually uh, get that behavioral behavioral change happening. And um, I think in order to progress to more sustainable actions, um, we need to go and look at the supply chain as a whole. It's um, I believe that sustainability can be driven um, up the supply chain all the way from the consumer back to where we source our raw materials. But and if consumers can change behavior and uh, insists on recycled pack packaging or no packaging at all in, in some instances, it forces retailers to, to um, sell what the customer wants. Um, and that means that potentially we need to rethink what the customers want and how we can offer it to them. Um, but in the same breath, I think it's, it's each step in the supply chain must actually work just closely with the next step in the supply chain, one up and one down. And hopefully that can converge to, to a single strategy and focus and unfortunately we are selfish human beings and we've got selfish strategies so it is difficult to align the entire supply chain to to that one focus goal and i think that's that's where circular economy needs to come in as it, it needs to 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 tell the whole supply chain so it's it's difficult to to um say it's not always about the money um a great deal of the world cannot afford it um, however, it must then be somehow subsidized by, by regulation and laws to drive this behavior change um, and saying no to non-sustainable practices in, in light of the bigger and the longer term picture that we're trying to, to achieve. Um, and if behavior can't be regulated, uh, then you need to, you need to, um, to somehow make it affordable to, to your consumers to actually be able to afford it. And that means that you as a company to absorb that cost um, and make it make it green for the rest of the world. Um, and I think also um, 
COVID to some extent have also um, put us one step back a bit in terms of the amount of waste that we've been generating. Um, everyone looking for individualized, individual packed goods um, and trying to keep everything clean and non-contaminated. Um, so in some, some extent, we, I think we need to reinforce that behavior once again and to, uh, remind people that we're sitting with finite resources and we need to change our behavior. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, okay, so now a couple of additional questions and follow-on from what I have heard you say. Uh, we've got this tension between strategy is long-term, uh, but people are wanting these short-term returns. You know, how do I feel benefit in this quarter that I'm functioning in right now? We take that in combination with incrementalism is not going to be sufficient, and then we compare that to a highly complex stakeholder environment. So. Uh, Mushai, maybe I'll start with you, and then Sherry would like your thoughts as well, uh, and we'll go from there. So, Mushai, how do we how do we balance this as you work across yeah. all the different uh, organizations you're working across? How do we boost them forward a bit more? Yeah, it's uh, I guess it's the big question around some of these big changes that we need to make, but perhaps it, you know, supply chains are very very complex, and like Anton mentioned, you know, getting people. To change, it's it's also, you know, your suppliers. How are you going to get your suppliers to change? How are you going to get your consumers to change? And, you know, people are worried about being the first on stage to do something because it's like, uh, will my consumers buy it? So if I have a supermarket and I say now um, I'm not going to be packaging the vegetables, you have to bring your own bags, will the consumers come or will they walk to the to the you know the supermarket next door so we are caught in between that uh thing about because and it was what i was talking about earlier we all have to move together if we don't move together it's very difficult in different pockets to try and move on your own um and so that complication is what makes it um uh, uh difficult but i think th the first thing is to engage and probably is to say like events like this you know it's in a sense, peculiar that we talk about circular economy at a supply chain conference, not an environmental conference. So it is a topical issue now. So it's coming up. But, you know, you look at the history of it, it's not a new subject. People in the 60s were talking about the environment and before. But it, it was kind of fringe. So it's coming up to the fore. And that is the beginning, I think, when as everybody is talking about it. Then now what we need to do is just try and get those coalitions of people who want to make uh, changes but again, I think uh, it's understand it's going to take us time, although we don't have time. We need to start. <laughs> you know, it's going to take us time, but we need to do it now. So we've got to have a sense of urgency. We do a lot of uh, tree planting here. And the, the story is, uh, or the, the quote is, the best time to plant a tree is 30 years ago. <laughs> okay, it was 30 years ago. The next best time is now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so it's about how, how do we do something now and start thinking through the entire supply chains. Because I think the fact that we now have people thinking through the entire supply chain and not just maybe uh, small aspects of it about where we're getting our power, how do we save energy and that kind of thing. Once we start that thinking, it gives us the, that opportunity to change. And I think to some extent, Sherry is right. There's a lot of things we can do very quickly that are not going to take, you know, it doesn't take too much to do. You can actually do it very quickly. And those we should all do as quickly as we can. Yeah. Super. So this uh, idea of incrementalism around how do I save energy? How do I save water? Instead, we need to start thinking about circular across the entire supply chain. And as we make that switch, it'll it'll feel more, uh, more complete, more robust. Uh, Sherry, interested in your thoughts on this balance and this tension of how to show me right now my return versus... Um, you know, 1% incrementalism might show us improvement in this quarter, but how do we help to shift away from uh, and really move forward instead? So uh, when you think about shared responsibility, and I think that that's how we're, we're framing this due to the amount of collaboration that's needed to scale the circular economy, it's the concept of doing well and doing good. So making the fiscal argument for change but then also, like I mentioned in my opening statement, we actually have to just do this because it's the right thing for humanity and our planet. Uh, what I find is, you know, that short term mindset. So quarter end, 
month in, year in, typically the ROI period is extended for sustainability initiatives. So you could take an 18 month to 24 month look or payback period. Um, and we're just not used to that yet. With circularity, I think we might not have that tension. Um, but when it comes to scaling beyond the pilot stage, then that's where it gets a little bit more complex as, as the panelists have mentioned. So long-term value cre creation, this is sustained competitive advantage, right? So it's not just something that can typically be outsourced to a third party. This is something that's unique to your brand, your organization, your trading partners, and it's the ability to create network-based stewardship. So it really is like everyone has described, um, supply chains being the conduit for change. Each person, each, each stakeholder across all nodes holding hands and they're achieving these goals together because you can't optimize in a silo. You know, this, this will not scale unless everyone participates in a meaningful way and they have that North Star. Net North Star, I think we're going to talk about in the next question, the SDGs, um, leading with purpose into a purpose economy. And then also knowing that we just have to we have to get in the canoe, people. <laughs> <laughs> what are you waiting for? Sherry steering everyone in. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thank you. Uh, and as you say, we are going to move on to our second topic. So this first topic is all about shoot. Let's just get going. Uh, there's a lot more we can share about this on on how best we do that, et cetera. And man, if we had more time, we would certainly dive into those. But we're going to move into the second idea um, around this this first mover disadvantage. Uh, Musha, you started talking about this uh, a little bit in the disadvantage on on first mover. Keen, if you could uh, share maybe an example of how this impacts. So, for example, with the dozens or hundreds of, of manufacturing sites that you help to advise and guide. Um, what is it, how do we help to de-risk this idea of these first few that take the first steps? How do we share that um, they did not in fact fall off a cliff and they have been successful? How do we get those, uh, that encouragement for the more conservative decision makers uh, who aren't willing to take these risky first moves uh, that can cause these disadvantages for us. What are your yeah, thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think um, actually what stops people getting onto the canoe, that's another nice uh, <laughs> line, it, is, is just is the fear. You know, is this going to sink or are we going to, you want to row out there into the lake? It's, it seems on our own. It just seems a little bit scary going out there. But I think uh, that's been changing now. And that's that's great because right now, you know, everybody's getting onto the canoe. So it's it's easy for you. You know, you, if you start talking about environmentalism, sustainability, and so on, at least people understand what you're talking about. So 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 that's great. But obviously, in a, at a place like this on supply chains, everybody's thinking about the cost. Because is this going to cost me more? And if it costs me more, um, it's going to be a problem for my business, my market share, you know, just the normal metrics that we are measured on in, in a business. So how are we going to be able to do this? And of course, in some instances, you can't even find the partners. I think like it was mentioned earlier, who's going to do this for me? And I think, well, now there are businesses like Inigo said and Anton can advise you. There, there are places you can get this, but sometimes you just can't find the people who are going to help you build a circularity, either bringing you in material that is recycled at a proper level or taking your waste or whatever you you'd consider waste, uh, you know, I think taking the circularity of bringing back raw materials, I think it still becomes a big issue. Um, so we've got to work on this together. And that's what one of the benefits of associations like we have at the Association of Manufacturers is have bringing in people together so that you can have the conversation and make those linkages. Again, probably at a conference like this is you meet the people, make the connections, and you can then start finding somebody who will do something for you and, and move it, uh, move along. So you can't do it alone. It's finding the partnership and finding the partnership. On the other hand, we also need to get uh, consumers on board and to accept the changes that are going to be necessary because it's not going to be um, easy. I think, in, let's say, in Kenya, for instance, we were all used to getting 
you know, shopping bags, plastic bags at the supermarket. When you went there, they'd give you bags and, and, you know, you did whatever you did with them. Now we don't have them. So you have to remember to carry your bags. So you're going to have to buy one. And we now remember to carry our bags. We always have them in our car. You know, okay, it's a bit of a... Is it? It's not what it was before. It's a bit less comfortable. But come on, it's just putting a bag in your car. How yeah, difficult so. is that? Okay, it's not that. It's not that hard. So it changes a few things, but you know we can still do it and move on. And then finally, I think where we are still having some challenges is with regulation and government, because even though government wants to move things and change things, for instance, in Kenya we are still working around what kind of plastic. Um, what can you use recycled plastic for? What is food grade recycled plastic? And uh, what are the processes it needs to go for? So there is also a regulatory aspect where we need to make sure that the law, the law and all our regulation is all around and all the standards we've had is all around a linear economy. We need to start moving them towards a circular economy so that they have those aspects in them. And then that way we'll be able to, yeah. Thanks. Perfect. Quite a bit to unpack there, uh, so I'll come back to a couple of points you've made. Uh, but the first one, if I think about the plastic bag of the supply chain, it's really the pallet. Uh, it used to be that the only option was you get a reusable pallet. Uh, you ship something, a pallet is supplied, and you don't have to deal with it. You don't have to put the pallet in the car. Uh, now we have an option that's the reusable bag. So, Inigo, I'm really keen to hear from you. Um, <clears throat> Chep has already done this. There is no more business case. You're currently functioning globally with reusable pallets. Uh, you've taken the plunge. You're, you're being successful. You're going to build additional services out around this. Can you talk through um, those initial steps of entering into a new market, bringing on new customers, the transition that they feel on uh, any fear in switching away from their reusable? Are there Throw away bags to reusable bags uh, yeah. with the pallet. Yeah, uh, happy to compare our, our pallet with, with a plastic bag, but only if it's reusable. If not single use, definitely not, not a good comparison. Uh, but yes, obviously, you know, in order for our model to work, uh, we need uh, an infrastructure, let's say, there set up in place, and, and we need scale. Uh, and it is true that, you know, when we expand in the new territories, uh, sometimes if it's a developed economy, then the, the infrastructure, the supply chain infrastructure is already there, let's say, let's assume. So the processes, the systems, the, the standardization is already there. And therefore, it's all around, you know, expanding the network and, and bringing companies together to collaborate on, on expanding the solution. The biggest challenge is working in, in countries or regions that are not as developed, uh, because there you have two challenges. On the one hand is, you have a developing infrastructure that requires, you know, uh, further modernization, and then you need to generate the scale as well. So, in order for us to do that, I mean, you know, my, my three takeaways that I would that we, that we share with everybody is that the first one it would be basically around standardization, as I mentioned before. The sooner you can standardize, the better, because then from there, from that standard, then the whole supply chain will build on. The longer it takes you to, you know, harmonize. The, the processes, the systems, et cetera, then the longer the conversion to the circular economy is going to be. The second point is, a, is around collaboration. And, and look, much I already mentioned how important it is to bring all of sta the stakeholders together. Usually, we don't do things on our own. When we enter a new market, we usually do it through or in partnership with one of our customers that is also entering a market or is also already present in, in that market. And, and obviously, we use the expertise, you know, and, and that's probably rather than a disadvantage, it's a first mover advantage, because obviously, we have a track record of doing it in other places. So we use that expertise, obviously, with the local knowledge to be able to scale it at that, at that uh, local country, let's say. And then the third point, and again, very much in line with what has been already said, is around the long term. Look, this is not something that is going to happen tomorrow. This is something that takes time, you know, changing the supply chain in countries like India or in China is not going to happen on one day to the other. So we need to be very patient. And that's where that balance comes. And even for a company like ours, when we've been doing this, you know, for, for many years, that's a challenge at the end. You know, when, when we think about our PL and the investments we need to make, thinking about a return in 10, 20, 30 years, because that's how much, you know, how, how long this takes. And the approach we usually take there is, again, to start small. So we don't, you know, start a whole operation in China by trying to cover the whole geography. We first start with one customer doing, 
you know, small flows. Then we expand it to another customer, maybe to another region, another warehouse, maybe, you know, a, a different city. Again, no, we try to expand it in a gradual way uh, so that it's manageable already uh, also from from the, you know, financial uh, point of view. I think that's that's really important. Very cool. I'm thinking about the parallels of using resources and materials like different metals as you're thinking about entering a market and reusing the flows in one area and then expanding. And you've got me thinking on that. Uh, Anton, would like to hear from you. So um, sometimes decisions are taken by uh, a consumer or customer, and sometimes it's by a supplier. Uh, The example you have shared earlier uh, as we were preparing for this panel is that while some consumers bring their own bags, we come back to the bags again, uh, it's more efficient for the retailer just to stop giving them uh, for free. So uh, a choice made by a consumer versus a forced choice. And my own personal choice, my my personal perspective is that um, widespread change in the circular economy will not come from changing consumer behavior. It will be it will change based on the system that we build back to Sherry's earlier point that there's no good decisions in a bad system. Um, can you share your thoughts on, from a supply chain perspective, what are some of those forcing functions that we could do uh, throughout the supply chain? One example might be to say, hey, customer, as your supplier, I now use CHEP pallets. You're going to need to use CHEP pallets. This is how you're going to do business with me. Um, can you think of some ways that we could change the behavior throughout the supply chain? Um, yeah, sure. So, um, so it's actually interesting, uh, the whole um the whole journey of, of plastic bags. I know we keep on going back to this, but um, usually we always got the bags for free. Then actually we started paying for bags. And now a lot of the retailers from their side are actually saying, we don't want to offer you any more bags and you have to bring your own, as uh, Mushai has said. And that's good to see that it, um, it, it isn't a consumer-driven thing necessarily. It is also up the street, and they're also willing to, to, um, to make those ends meet. But... Um, some of the difficult things, though, is is that um, all of this obviously requires it's the cost of investment, and it's it's always difficult to to ascertain where where do you push these costs? Do you push it onto the consumer, um, or do the companies absorb that cost in the bigger picture, saying that we want to be a, uh, the the body of of uh, a circular supply chain or just a greener supply chain, and um, so it's that very difficult thing, and and if you if you pass on on um, the cost to the consumer, they might go to the next uh, guy who hasn't gotten to that step. Um, and it talks about the the first mover disadvantage that you've spoken to Mushai about is that those first guys might lose out on a bit of sales because they were actually the first people to move, which is sort of actually crazy because you you meant to be supporting so supporting that. So, um, in and that's the, that's the part of, 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 call it the consumer, consumer behavior. Um, if we then also look at, um, the companies need to obviously also invest in research and development. And that now speaks to what Ingo says. It's, it's, and also contrary to what uh, Sherry wants in terms of, of things happening now, that there is, it, it, it takes time to, to research uh, and develop things and actually make it, make it worthwhile for the companies. Unfortunately, they're not going to dish out, um, dish out their, their funds and, and uh, lose out on profits necessarily just, um, just for making the steps immediately. It, it is a, a research and a development thing. And I think that's where companies need to, um, now, now is the time to do that is to increase their budgets for research and development and change that behavior of saying, well, let's put a lot bigger focus on the sustainability and make it work for the whole supply chain and uh, share those costs somehow and, and make it um, paint the picture that we need to do this for, for the entire world. Right. Um, and then finally, um, I think um, is, is what also I think Misha has also touched on. It's, um, you can only go so, so far with, with the consumer. Um, but at some point, I think regulation has been – regulation and laws is, is going to be the way that things are changed. Um, and I think that the governing bodies that, that drive um, that drive these uh, terms of uh, sustainability and so on need to need to need to focus on that and put some infra- infrastructure changes in, in place to to support this um, this whole drive. Um, it, it's not a matter of just laying down the law and saying um, you must do this, but there's not been a bigger picture behind it of and how do we actually um, 
how do we actually action this and how do we make it consumer friendly to actually abide by all these laws i mean you, you might have a have a bit of a, a, a uprising from from consumers if you can't uh, if you can't um, meet their demands uh, as well so it's it's once again it's that symbiotic relationship between consumers and suppliers and just finding that sweet spot um, and and making that that change together and, and saying yes we, we're going to work towards this this goal and I think that's the behavior that we need to see changing perfect thank you uh, all right so we've had some really interesting different opinions actually about uh, we've been talking about the planet for a long time it's become more normalized and in the same way we're still not taking care of the planet so there obviously are some speed bumps here so Sherry would love to hear from you when you think about social responsibility um, what can we learn from the shifts in the last years towards social responsibility uh, and apply it to circularity or whatever it is that we're going to end up calling a circular economy? It may not be the same name, but this idea of doing good uh, because it's the right thing to do. Uh, any lessons we can glean from from shifts you've seen happen in the last, let's say, 10 years? Sure. So circular economy and corporate social responsibility, they are interconnected concepts. And when we say CSR, uh, in my opinion, we're talking about accountability and transparency into business operations that impact the world we share and the communities where a business operates in that end-to-end -end breadth of supply chain. And this translates into CSR reporting and some of the ESG disclosures tied to corporate investment, supply chain sustainability, ethical sourcing, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion reporting, and so on. And this sort of pressure to report and be held accountable gives broader stakeholders visibility into stewardship and shared responsibility, which I talked a little bit about before. So this frames an opportunity for circular economy objectives to operate in the same way by identifying measuring, standardizing, and communicating actions. And in this, in my opinion, I think tying them to the 2030 vision, the sustainable development goals is another, another opportunity. As more companies adopt the SDGs globally, circularity is tucked under SDG 12. Um, but through these discussions, and for anyone who doesn't know what SDG 12, it's responsible production and consumption. So this is the life breath of supply chains. Um, you know, we're able to touch the broad vision to change the world that we share. We're talking about building gender equity, sustainable communities, reducing poverty and hunger. And, you know, when you think about social responsibility, we're actually able to empower families to earn a decent wage and in turn potentially use that money to educate our youth. We're improving life on land, life underwater, and we're, we're doing this all through partnerships as the, the panelists have described. So this is the interconnected vision that can be realized through circularity and supply chains. <laughs> <laughs> we need supply chains <laughs> they power the world <laughs> perfect i think that's lovely uh amazingly we have just two minutes left so i'm going to uh make a very difficult challenge to each of you to give us a, a 20 second closing thought <laughs> on one piece of advice for taking the next step to take uh your operations more circular so very briefly uh anton one closing thought from you please and you're on mute. Uh, thank you, Deborah. I'm um, sorry, I've just used my 20 seconds there. Um, so, yeah, I think, in short, I think we need to get in, into all into this boat. We need to get them together. Um, we need change all across the supply chain. We need uh, immediate behavior change. And, yeah, increase your budgets to, to sustainability and moving to a circular economy. Perfect. Uh, Sherry, one piece of advice. So everyone, this is an inflection point and the power of one person doing the right thing for the right reason at the right time can be the greatest influence in our society and in our world. And mobilizing 
one to many through collaboration can be transformative. We've designed our way into this and we can design our way out of it. So please get started. Perfect. Inigo. Sure, from my side, yeah, let's get started. And I think the, the key there is, look, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. I think the circular economy has been around for centuries. We just didn't call it that way back then. So look for pockets of excellence, areas in your business where you are already doing things around the circular economy, and then look to scale them up. And then, obviously, partnership to me is, is a key uh, component here. Collaborate with other like-minded, you know, uh, even competitors, let's say, that, you know, here in sustainability, thank God, Competition is, is is not even present, right? It's not a, a word that we discuss. So just collaborate with any partner that you see an opportunity to drive further initiatives. That's fantastic. Thank you. And Mushai, final closing thoughts. Yeah, I think for Africa, we we can't afford not to go circular. We can't afford any waste. We can't afford uh, the joblessness. We can't afford to avoid the innovation. Um, We're going through a pandemic, a big economic shock. Literally, we have to start changing the way we do things. And this is our opportunity. If we've been left behind in the industrial revolution, we can be ahead in the circular revolution. This is our chance. Thanks. Amazing. We can be ahead in the circular revolution. Uh, thank you, panelists, for your perspectives and your time. Thank you, audience, for sticking around with us and listening to these uh, ideas for change. And this closes our panel. Uh, please enjoy the rest of the conference today. And thank you for attending.